When we picture Jesus, we sometimes see him as a gothic, pale, somber figure. Or somehow, he's made of stained glass. The disciples are sepia-toned pages from an ancient parchment who, remarkably, speak with British accents. Picture Jesus and John based on the features of their region and their ages. Anthropologists have created an image of what Jesus must have looked like. John may have been a teenager, Jesus was around 30. Now imagine John's life before Jesus. He was a fisherman. Jewish boys learned to speak Hebrew, and to trade in the marketplace, they must have learned Greek. John obviously was literate enough to write his letters, but a fisherman's job was mundane. Think about he that boy with help. a simple life seeing Jesus walk on water for the first time. Since you live in a post-enlightenment world, you have just as much trouble picturing someone actually walking on water as picturing the disciples as teenagers sitting around laughing. Picture Jesus healing the sick and mobilizing the paralyzed. What would the thoughts of the average teenager be? That is unbelievable. Teach me how to do that. That is the best thing that's ever happened. Now imagine John four years later. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood up and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. John was now doing what Jesus had done. Now picture first century Ephesus. It was a first century San Francisco where ships pulled into the bay and ideas crawled off the ships. There was a monumental temple to Artemis, something that would later be called one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It had 127 columns, 24 tons apiece. There was a statue in the temple that the locals said had fallen from heaven, a statue of Artemis. They placed it in the temple and they worshipped it. There was a festival in the spring every year where they celebrated their first love, the love that they had at first. People would come and be engaged and make commitments to one another. There was a marketplace, the Agora. The riot over the Apostle Paul had come several years before when Christian evangelism wrecked the sale of souvenirs to tourists to the Temple of Artemis. There was a theater into which Paul had been dragged and almost killed. Imagine first century Rome. In 65 AD, Emperor Nero had begun the persecution of the Christians. After a fire in Rome, he blamed this new religious sect and began to torture them. He burned them at the stake to light his gardens at night. Eusebius tells us that Domitian continued the persecution of Christians. Suetonius tells us that Domitian himself demanded to be called Lord and God. John would have seen all this and said, I've walked with God. I've healed the paralyzed. You've got nothing. Bring it on. Revelation is a threat to the powers who assume too much. The Jewish people would have remembered and celebrated the fall of Babylon. Centuries before, they had been held in slavery by Babylon until Cyrus of Persia came and conquered it and set them free. They would have told stories gleefully about how the Babylonian empires of the world will fall. Revelation is a piece of conspiratorial literature. It's written against the Roman Empire, which ruled over the Jewish people and persecuted the Christians. Throughout the letter, it analogizes Rome to Babylon. In Revelation 17, it describes a prostitute who is drunk on the blood of those who had witnessed to Jesus. She sits on a beast with seven heads. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. This is John giving us a little insight into the code that he's using. Rome was well known as the city of seven hills. It's true to its geography. The seven heads are the seven hills. John's cue, this calls for a mind with wisdom, is a hint that we're supposed to understand and decode the symbolism that he's using. Elsewhere in the rabbinic literature, Rome and Babylon are compared to one another. The letter of Revelation is not first and foremost about the end of the world. It's about the end of the Roman Empire. In Revelation 13, the beast stands on the shore of the sea, as Rome does. The beast had many heads, and one head had been wounded and healed. Most likely, the many heads refer to the many Caesars who had ruled over Rome, and Nero, who had begun the persecution of Christians, had died when he stabbed himself in the throat, committing suicide. There were legends after his death that he had risen from the dead and that he would come back. Several impostors came and claimed to be him. One, at the end of the first century, during Domitian's rule, attempted a coup, but was executed. 
Again, in Revelation 13, John tells us, this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, which is the number of a man. That number is 666. He's telling us, decode this. The man's number is 666. The Hebrew alphabet in his day was used akin to the way we use Roman numerals on our clocks today, where individual letters represented numbers. If Nero Caesar is written out in Hebrew and the individual letters are equated to their numbers and those numbers are added up, they do add up to 666. The message of Revelation comes from a guy who, as a teenager, saw something life-changing. It was so big and so powerful that persecution and death, empire and emperor, Rome with its bread and circuses, were not enough to steer him off course. If imagining John as a teenager was difficult, now imagine him as an old man. Though his heart is all the more gentle after years of loving the community around him, his resolution is as tough as nails. He doesn't have a long life to look forward to. He has heaven to look forward to. Seeing death as merely the last door to walk through, running in the footsteps of the one who had walked on water, he looked at the terrorizing powers of the world around him, closing in on him and the church, and said, bring it on. That was John.